to happen so I can tell you I told you so. Okay. All right. I understand. That's very common. I like to play both sides. <laughs> He's right. flipping his penny. I'm going to flip the penny, call it tails, tails, it lands, and it lands tails. So we're one for one there you go. so far. Now, the next one up is the die. You've stuck to your guns with that coin. You've called yep. tails every time. You ha I have to keep calling tails. If I was a football player and I was the f captain of the Jets and I was sent out to the front or to the uh, center of the field to call, I would always call tails. But you're not doing the same with the die. The die? No. 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 You're I'm always just I'm doing what I feel is right. Okay. And what's right right now out of this 1-6-D is Last five. Last one. He says five. Two. Two. No good. Close. All right. The next one up is the number you said one out of seven. This is a one out of seven odds. You have to guess. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. One out of seven odds. You have to guess a letter. Oh. For, I switched it up. Okay. This is the definition of creativity, my friend. I know. You're very creative. <laughs> guess a letter from A to G. A to G. From A to G. That sounded a little more sarcastic than I intended. You really are creative. <laughs> a to G. I'm going to say C for Colin. Oh, I think you're going to be pleasantly nice. surprised. Nice. See, there we go. C for Colin. C for CLS. No, they're very, very good. Uh, the C and there? CLS is Colin, so there we go. That's or correct. it's actually Collins. Collins. But not like Phil Collins, <laughs> which we heard. You wish. I wish. I love Phil Collins. C C -C oh, one of the greats. Is that one of your favorites? <laughs> oh, take away. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Su, 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 you know what my favorite of all time is? Mm. I could feel it coming in the air tonight. That'll, that'll play in our Miami Vice episode that Colin's oh. dreading. <laughs> yeah, I got to go watch five seasons of Miami Vice oh at some point. God. I'll do it. It's the most depressing show ever. I'll do it. That's why I think you're going to love it. Oh, I love depressing it's things. It's dark. Oh, good. Is it really? Is it really it, dark? It really is remember. dark. That show is dark. I don't remember it being dark. I mean, you can't judge by the pastel colored clothing. It's dissonant. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> All right. So we have cards here. We have 12 cards, three of each suit. I'm just okay. going to pull one out. I've already shuffled them. I'm pulling this one out. I'm calling it a spade. Call a spade it's a, a spade. Uh, so two even. for four is not bad. But. Two for four is not bad. That's one of your better showings. Yeah, not bad. Two I'll allow four. that. Last one. Congratulations on your luck. Thank you. Thank you for playing. Thank you for uh, allowing me to play. <laughs> Anytime. Appreciate that. Anytime, my friend. That was a good opening segment. Oh, I'll be, you interested, liked it? To, I'll be interested to see what you come up with next. I have a whole list. It's very exciting. I'm excited. What's more exciting is to hear some of these greatest childhood oh, here we go. fears. I have a feeling you guys are going to make me laugh at these. Some of them are serious. Some of them are... Yeah, I think, I think we'll be able to find humor in almost all of these because, of course, childhood fears are almost always irrational. So, not always, but almost always yeah, irrational. Yeah, they could be, sure. So I just kind of have three pages of the memories you guys submitted. I want to read through them and then we'll intersperse our own as they make sense. And then when we get to the end of yours, if there are ones we haven't brought up yet, we can, of course, talk about those to round out this episode. So, Dig, I'm going to start with Jeremy Cochran, who said, was there a more irrational fear than thinking a shark was in your swimming pool of choice? <gasps> Insane, I know, but it was still there for me when I was younger, especially swimming at night. I so had this fear and still do. Really? I really, I, every time I swim in the pool as a child, as a kid, and we always had pools, grew up with a pool in the backyard, I never thought, I, and you know what the, you know what the most irrational thing about it is? I wouldn't be afraid if there was someone else in the pool with me. Does that make any sense? Completely irrational. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. It is a rat. I mean, it's completely it, it's, irrational. It's, but that's the same thing like when you're in the dark or something, and it's not as scary as if, if same if, exact thing. Yeah. You just have to have some like misery loves company kind of situation. <laughs> But yeah, I was never really afraid of the water. So you never thought that as a kid? No, I don't think so. You never fantasized about the shark in the swimming pool? Well, I would fantasize about different things happening in the pool, but, you know, when I was playing G.I. Joe or doing something like that, but it was never like a thing where I thought I was going to... It's never a dark fantasy. No, I will, I will bring up... One thing I will say, though, is that I saw a movie of some sort. I don't remember what it was, or it could have been a TV show where... God, I wish I remember what it was. Maybe someone can tell me what it what it was. If this strikes a, a memory, a deep memory, or <laughs> that anyone has. Sometime in the mid '90s, I saw something when we were still in the Marie Courthouse when we had the in-ground pool. Yeah. That like a girl was basically murdered in this movie or in this TV show. She like dove under the water. Then when she tried to come up, it was like covered in oh, plastic or something. So don't she couldn't tell me this. Fear. So she couldn't come up. I do remember that being a scary thing, like suffocating. Yeah. That's a big fear of mine. Being in, like not being able to breathe. Is, I have is, that too. Yeah, that's a that's a scary one for me. Yeah, that's a scary. And that thing you just said, I think about that too. 
Like, I, I remember for a while, like, coming up with my hand first. You know, sometimes you would emerge with your head, just to, like, make sure there was nothing there. That's Absolutely. another irrational fear. I, oh, my God. I wish God. I knew where that came from, because how is that even possible? It's like, not. It, it's really not. I really tend to think the most creative people have the most creative fears. You know? Possibly so. I think so. Chad Lewis wrote into us. Hi, Chad. Said, growing up in Massachusetts, the Cape and summer swimming is a rite of passage as much as Fenway Park and the Red Sox. I know where this is going. And in the Lewis family, another rite of passage <laughs> seems to be watching movies way too early on in our lives. Me and my brother grew up on Jaws as young ones, and I was most thinking? certainly a kid who was afraid of being devoured in any body of water and was completely unwilling to take anybody's word ab otherwise about any other body of water. I still have trouble swimming in the ocean or anything I can't see the bottom of today. So were you afraid of swimming in the ocean ever and the creatures Yo, that yeah. would, would encounter you there? Yeah, you know what's funny about the ocean, though? You, we grew up, everybody that grew up in the 70s, 80s, even 90s, we all grew up with the Jaws fear. You know, Spielberg put the fear of God in us when it came to going to the beach. But there was a there was a long period of time where the beach, like swimming in the ocean, didn't bother me. But now I think about it a lot. Now I think so. I love swimming in the ocean. In fact, we just got back from the shore. My family's still down there. They'll be home tomorrow. But we, I was down the shore last week. The water. I was telling you and Dad, the water was so warm. It was like a bathtub down in Avalon, New Jersey. It's gorgeous. And we, me and my daughter, my 12-year-old, swam for like two hours in the ocean. And I think I think about it now with kids. And there was also a great white sh uh, sighting somewhere in Delaware or something. My father-in-law is very good about telling us and scaring the hell out of us every time there's a, the, you know, the, there's almost never an incident, but you always think about it, you know, especially because the ocean, it's just the inherent thing of the ocean. It's so murky. You can't see, you know, especially in the northeast of the United States, it's not like swimming in the Caribbean or something where you could see the bottom in six feet of water. You can't see anything. So, and in fact, you know what happened to me, Kyle? This never happened to me before. And you have to remember, me and Colin grew up on Long Island. Something really big swam into the side of my leg. Now, it felt like very smooth and round. It felt like the head of a fish, but it was big. I mean, it felt like a big fish. That's never happened to me before. I felt some kind of sea life when swimming in the beach. That's the first time. And you, I knew it was something living, and I think it was really honestly just a fish, but that's never happened to me. It, it yeah, kind of creeped creepy. me out. That's kind of creeped creepy. me out a little bit. My whole thing with swimming in the ocean, I love swimming in the ocean, and my whole thing about it is that it's just worth the risk. People are going to die in the ocean. <laughs> Shit's going to happen to you in the ocean. You're not meant to be in the ocean. We are not meant to be in the water. And so it's just one of those risks so that you run. And it's just a numbers game. It's like just like anything else. When there's just a mass of people doing something, someone's going to get hurt or die doing it. And some crazy shit's going to happen to them. So I <laughs> That is an insane way so, to look at it. So I've, I've just never really been that afraid of it. You know what really creeped me out more than anything were jellyfish, especially yes. on the South Shore of Long Island. They would they we would they would like really swarm there at certain times of the year. And it's like it's fucked up. Dad that, used to get hit a lot. That's creepy as shit. And I don't they especially because the waves on Long Island chop them up so bad that they're mostly dead. And it's just their bodies. Just Diced up bodies. Float, but they're still poisonous if any of their little tentacles get you and then you have to you get stung or whatever even yeah, they if they're hurt. dead they hurt so that used to not creep me out but that would scare me where if i saw that i wouldn't want to go in the ocean and then and, there's the what the portuguese man of war or whatever that oh yeah like the man of war yeah. really like a kind of a deadly and Besides they're really the tiny box jellyfish yeah they're tiny i think too i think these the, the most deadly yeah because the box jellyfish i think is like off of australia or something right that's in different waters and they're like apparently like the size of like a quarter or something oh, weird like that. that. I didn't know that. They're yeah. that tiny. Oh, wow. I think like the some of the deadliest jellyfish are some of the smallest ones. Why are jellyfish so mean? I don't know. They're creepy. What's wrong with them? They're really creepy. I don't they even are creepy. I don't understand how they even work. They're just very strange. Little robots. Yeah, they're very dumb, like prim primitive animals that have just survived all this time. They don't seem to really operate on the same level as even a lot of other sea creatures. So, yeah, they really creeped me out. I don't know. I think I was stung a few times, but. I would stay out of the water for them. I, I get creeped out if anything touches me in the water, though. Like if there's a lot of seaweed and stuff kind of percolating around there, that kind of creeps me out, too. Okay. But now, where do you stand on lakes, Carl? Lakes are a little scarier. I agree. These encapsulated bodies of water. Snapping turtle. Oh, that, that's yeah, that they can get you. They they're leeches. They're, le oh, leeches. I never thought of because they're in fresh water. Correct. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So lakes. Yeah, I'm not a big lake. I don't know. I'm not sure. I've, I think I swam in Glacier Lake in Montana. I think that might be one of the only lakes I've ever swam in in my life. That must have been cool. It was free. It was really cool. Was it, it was cold? fucking frigid. I remember actually that dad told the story that like he immediately made me get out because it was like so cold. Too cold. 
uh, in the uh, it's, it is glacial meltwater. So I assume it's wow. Uh, I assume oh, it's very cold. Man, that's gotta be. Ugh. But I remember that very well. 1995, summer 1995. Jose Horich wrote into us and said, as a child, my fears were nature based and usually were things I would never come across in the area I would live in. Things like tornadoes, piranhas and lava. But nothing was scarier <laughs> than quicksand. I was terrified of walking a path in the woods, just accidentally fall into that liquid earth of death. It's funny to think about now as that's never going to happen. But as a child, quicksand was everywhere in my mind. Quicksand's fascinating because it was movies and especially video games that put quicksand on my on my exactly radar. I was but say. I don't really think it operates like that in the real world. I don't think it's like sucking you under in two seconds. Maybe there's like some places where the earth is Wait, liquefying. What like that. is it? What? Let's talk about quicksand for a second. This is a fascinating topic. What the hell is it? I'm going to look. I'm going to look it up because I don't I remember looking at like a video not too long ago, maybe a couple of years ago about it's what a it, real what, thing. Like, it is a real thing. Quicksand is a real thing, but okay. it's not what you think. I don't think I'm going to the quicksand wiki right now. All right, please. So it says quicksand is a colloid hydrogel consisting of fine granular material such as sand, silt or clay and water. Quicksand forms in saturated loose sand when the sand is suddenly agitated. When water in the sand cannot escape, it creates a liquefied soil that loses strength and cannot support weight. Quicksand can form in standing water or in upwards floating water. And then let's see. Blah, 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 blah. Liquefaction. That's where I know that from. Liquefaction from earthquakes. It says is a special case of quicksand. In this case, sudden earthquake forces immediately increase the poor pressure of shallow groundwater. And then it says in popular culture, quicksand is a trope of an adventure fiction, particularly in film, where it is frequently and unrealistically depicted as being able to actively suck people, animals or objects. Because it can never be that deep, can it? I guess. Well, what I'm saying is, is I guess theoretically the earth can liquefy so violently that I guess it could suck you under. But it makes it seem like this happens in like seconds. You step into this thing and you're gone. And so I've never been afraid of quicksand, but maybe it's just that fear. When you go into the quicksand, you're going to suffocate, and that, that touches that fear for me. Oh, man. And they say don't struggle, right? You can't, if, or you'll sink faster. Right, but this it is, was always, it's almost like a trope. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's interesting. I never thought, I never knew to think, uh, to research whether it existed or not. So that's interesting. Another thing to be afraid of. Yeah, why not? Very, very nice. Austin Smith wrote in and said, hey, guys, I think Dagan might understand this one as one of my biggest childhood fears, uh -huh. which was related to the classic animated movie Peter and the Wolf. OK, that wolf scared the living shit out of me. I can still vividly remember the om ominous music that would play while the wolf was menacingly walking behind the trees that would haunt me every night before I would go to sleep for years. And yet my dumb ass would rent it every time my dad would take me to Hastings. I don't know what was wrong with me. Do you know that <laughs> that what he's talking about? Yes, there? I know Peter and the Wolf. I, I, but you know, it's funny. I never really was afraid of that film. I was never afraid of that one. I, we, you know, we'll talk about my childhood fears and things I was afraid of, including cartoons, in a little while. But yeah, that one, I don't, I don't see that one. But it's funny how different things. That's the funny thing about fears. It's funny how different things affect different people. You know, he just saw something in it that that was that frightened him. You know. Ian wrote in. Hi, Ian. You said you know how you can hear your heartbeat when your ear is against the pillow. When I was little, I used to think that noise wasn't my heartbeat and instead a woman who lived under the floor in my room. Each beat was one of her footsteps ascending this gigantic stairway from her lair all the way up to my bedroom. I'd have dreams that she would make it to the top and open the trap door and stare at me, convincing me to come down into her underground dungeon. Oh my! I tried to fall asleep as fast as possible because I didn't want to see her. Ian's crazier than I am. <laughs> I didn't think that was possible. You know what this reminded me of for me? What was that show, I think, in the 80s where... There was like a giant and he would come down the stairs and like hit his head or something like that. Do you know what I'm talking about? It was like this fantastical. Was it? It was a, it was a live action fantastical oh, live action? thing about a giant or something that lived in a house okay. or some sort of building. OK, where he, I think, would come down and like hit his head on. Oh, was it the monsters? No, no, it wasn't okay, the monsters. Okay. No, definitely not the monsters. OK. It was like something newer than that. Maybe from at the earliest, the 70s, the latest, the 80s. OK, it was this thing that I think I used to rent from the library or something. I I don't know if it had to do with like. Was it like Jack and the Beanstalk or something? Weird? I don't know. It was like some, maybe it had something to do know. with like some weird. I don't know. If, does anyone out there know what I'm talking about? Where this giant would like come down the stairs. It wasn't like necessarily was supposed action. to be scary. Right. But that's what came to mind for me. Dana might know because she might have been the one that our sister, Dana, might have been the one that rented that for me. She worked at the library. But that's like something that reminds me of that. I don't know what that is, though. I have to look into that. Yeah, that it wasn't a film. It wasn't a film, I don't think. I Some think it was a TV show. show. Powell Predke wrote in, 
and said, I was born in 1985 and sometime before 1990 while watching the evening news. My dad mentioned that some guy could press a big red button and we would all be blown to smithereens. For fear of he for fear of hearing this really happening, I didn't watch the news for many years following that. Feels slightly too late for a Cold War based fear, but I was still living through it in the 90s in Poland. To be honest, we're always still one stupid mistake or decision away from global annihilation. So take that as a ray of sunshine this summer. All the best, guys. What do you think of that, Dig? That's very interesting. Well, because you had a similar fear of nuclear holocaust, didn't you? I did. I did. So talk to me a little bit. About I live well, well, my own. Yeah. I never feared nuclear holocaust. I welcome it. So what do you? Yeah, what, but you were so, born because I was. You got to think. I was. I was born in '73. I grew up in like you know the in part of the Cold War between you know the United States and the Soviet Union and. There was so much, we talked about this on the show before, there was so much media surrounding that, whether it was movies, you know, especially movies, you know, it was like the, the it was always US versus the, versus Russia. I mean, even when you look at things like Rocky, like Rocky IV, right? Well, even when you take things like Red Dawn, from Red Dawn to Rocky IV, it was in all the media. War games. War games, you know. What, whatever, whatever it was, Iron Eagle, China Syndrome. There's a lot of stuff. <laughs> so much stuff. We were really flooded with that, and I did fear it. I mean, I, I think, I think because I realized I was probably old enough to realize because I was a little older even that that's a pretty horrific way to to go. The probably the worst way to go. I mean, radiation. I, I mean, to, or to, you know, to get like burned alive. Like well, that, that would, would be a pretty instantaneous way to go. That would be fine. But being in the rem, like. If you were in Nagasaki or Hiroshima yeah. and you died days later, that was way worse than the people that died Oof. immediately. Yeah, I was afraid of that for a long time. There was a this is a really weird story. I don't know if you guys will understand this, but I'll tell you anyway. I was so scared of this for a long time that I used to think I heard bombs dropping. And there was a patch of Sunrise Highway on Long Island where mom and dad would frequently motor down. And I would when I was in the back of the car, it was like when you go on that you know what that certain type of pavement on the highway, it turns into like like almost like serrated concrete. Yeah, yeah. Du, 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 and it cre yeah, it yeah makes, I love it, that. It's divots, but right. it also could create a it could create like a high pitched hum because of the t if especially if the divots are shallow, so it turns into like just being smooth to being like like type of thing. And I used to think that was the sound of bombs dropping. Oh, interesting. Oh man, I that's was a, out of my uplifting. mind. I was out of my mind with that. Did you? I don't know that I really understood the nature of nuclear war until I was a teenager. Did you? When did you really understand what it what like what that was? Like what? It's a good, it's a great. Like question. radiation poisoning and it's a really what we did question. to Japan and all that kind of stuff. When did you really understand that like the bombs were never used again because of how horrific they Probably were? Probably going on like nine or ten years old when you realized all that stuff not only from the movies but also that there was a there was also a really horrifying i think you and i have discussed it before Kyle. there was a really horrifying mini series that was on tv in the 80s called the day after right and that that was another one and that was another one that really made, raised my eyebrows because mom and dad, it was one of those things that mom and dad were like you were forbidden to watch this thing so that just raised my interest because they the knew you well your psychosis they knew me well so enough well, like you can't watch you especially can't watch this meanwhile yeah. they would have been like you can definitely watch this but just don't try to will it into existence <laughs> right exactly <laughs> and you know movies like grave of the fireflies eventually came along which were animated films, but you know, dealt with the very serious ramifications of nuclear war and what happened in World War II with the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And yeah, dude, that, I, that was a big one for me. I don't even know exactly when when I broke myself of that fear or when I stopped when I got over it. I was I was definitely a teenager though, you know, maybe 14, 15. I started to relax a little bit about it. But the, you know, and of course, the Gucci fireworks thing didn't help. Yeah, which we told that story. Uh, what did we tell that story? On the 4th the, of July episode? No, we told that one. Yeah, what episode was that? It wasn't 4th of July. It wasn't. Well, I don't know. It's in there somewhere. Yeah, it's Childhood Stories, whatever. It's in the uh, PlayStation 2 episode. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's funny, though, Dave, because, yeah, nuclear war never scared me because once I understood, really understood it, and you understood mad, mutually assured destruction and all those kinds of things, you realized that it was never going to happen. The, the only, it, it literally never is going to happen. If it didn't happen in 1962 and 1963 with the Bay of Pigs oh, and, yeah, and the Cuban Cuba Missile Crisis, sure. if it didn't happen ever with, you know, during the Korean or Vietnam, Vietnamese war, or the Vietnam War, Nixon famously said that he would have dropped bombs on Cambodia and Laos and Vietnam if he didn't, if he thought he could get away with it, basically. 
we just live in a situation where mutually assured destruction ensures that it either you're going to have a preemptive strike that does so much damage that they can't hit you back or you just don't risk it at all. Yeah. And we have a no first strike policy. So it would only be defensive on our part to use the bomb. So I knew right. no one was going to I just kind of realized at an early age no one's going to do it to us and no cuz we will obliterate them. The the second we found out that there were missiles in the air long before the inter the ICBMs got here. Everything out of Omaha and all the stuff in the middle of the country would have been launched. And there, if there's one thing I can tell you about America, especially for people that don't live here, have never been here, and don't really understand us as well as we understand ourselves, we are not going down without bringing anyone else, everyone else with us. I guarantee you that. I, I don't, I'm not even being facetious. If, we wouldn't be like, ah, fuck it. We would probably launch every missile we had, and which then is, be like, which we're, is all, we're all to think about. We're all gonna die. It's yes. crazy. You know what the only thing is, but I totally hear you, and I think that's the only thing that pacified me, Kyle, about that. It was like, you know, just being rational enough to think, like, nobody wants to destroy the planet, you know, but now you think about terrorism. That's the scary yeah, thing. Yeah, dirty bombs are the thing, because there's a lot of unaccounted for uranium and plutonium from the Soviet satellites that probably made their way to terror cells beginning in the late 80s, early 90s. And even stuff from Libya and other countries that, and South Africa that gave up their bombs voluntarily in, you know, those are the only two countries in the in world history that gave up their bombs. Yeah. So there's a lot of fissile material out there that I think is unaccounted for. And all it takes is a little bit crudely made into some sort of dirty bomb set off in Times Square and you are in big trouble. Wow. Be because it wouldn't be an explosion. It would just be it would just kill you with radiation. It'd be really bad news. So. I agree with you that that's scary, but that's not a nuclear bomb. That's that's something else. That's like a that's almost more sinister in a way. Yeah, in some way. But scary. it's all sinister. That's why I'm so I become so passive as I've gotten older. I used to be really neoconservative when I was younger, especially in my teens and early 20s in college. I was all about the Iraq war and all that kind of stuff as I was very open about. And I, I, it was a huge mistake. I've just become so passive. Peace and prosperity. Commerce with all alliance with none. <laughs> As George Washington would I say. I know one of your great fears, but I'm going to give you a chance to bring it up. If you don't bring it up, then I'm going to, I'm going to have to bring it up later. But we won't talk about that yet. Uh, is it the tickly monster? Oh, I wasn't even thinking about the tickly monster. I mean, we'll get there as well because that's oh, in my notebook. Oh, you have to talk about that. I thought that was going to be it because you're so you're such a, you're like the progenitor of that. In a lot I of totally ways. forgot about that. Well, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Josh Korea wrote in and said, hello, Colin and Dagan. First off, this podcast is without a doubt my favorite podcast. So keep up the amazing oh, work. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Josh. It is pretty good, isn't it? So my childhood fear is dolls. Yes, dolls. This fear began when I went to Mexico with my family. There was this approximately three foot Chucky doll in the closet downstairs. And my cousin said that sometimes it would randomly walk and laugh. Oh, no. That pretty much sealed my fear, my fear of That's dolls. That's not fair. Fair because Chucky is, a, is playing on the fear of dolls anyway. Are you afraid of dolls? Nope. You know, aren't afraid of like something springing to life. If Chucky came after me, I would punch Chucky. So you know how far I would kick Chucky if he came after yeah, me. Yeah, what is it about him that makes him so un insurmountable? I don't know. Voiced by Mark Hamill in the latest. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah, in the latest movie, and Orby Plaza's in that too. Not bad. She's pretty. She's she's cute. She's definitely she's cute. adorable. I like how you use the word cute for hot. You use the word cute for I'm trying hot. to keep it. I'm trying to keep it PG thirteen. I don't think it's. Is it not PG to say it's, a girl is hot? A woman is hot? No, a man I don't is think, hot? No, I mean, you know me. I, I do know you. You know me. I'm a classy guy. You are a little classy. You're a lot classier than I am. She's hot. I'm. Thank you very much. <laughs> I never really feared this stuff. Now, I will say this. Okay. And I was bringing this up. This is, I guess, tangentially related. Our neighbor across the street, who I will not name when we were living in Marie Court. Okay. She, she's come up before. Perfectly fine yeah. woman. She had a at some point. Do you remember her having a Virgin Mary statue in her in her house? No. Yeah. Oh yeah. And that was. I thought she was Jewish. No, her husband was Jewish. Oh, okay. okay. She was she was a Holy Roland Catholic. I and, didn't know that. Yeah, and she had this weird Mary statue. So for people that aren't familiar with Catholicism, we basically worship Mary as if it's a polytheistic religion where. It's like Jesus, well, the Trinity, and then Mary's like up there, yeah. right? She's yeah. up there. Yes. If, if she's not a god, she's like a demigod. And I've always been fascinated by that. I always think Christianity is inherently polytheistic anyway, because the Trinity makes no sense. But when you bring in like Mary as a total different entity, we really respect Mary in the Catholic culture. And yes. she had a statue that I thought was incredibly creepy. I find this, I find Jesus on the cross in a church, very creepy. I find Mary statues, very creepy. All that kind of like religious iconography. Okay. The, the stations of the cross. Very creepy. Okay. All That's right. the kind of stuff that creeps me out. 
You're right about Chucky. There must have been something about him, though, that made him insurmountable in those movies. But I don't I don't quite recall. Yeah, there must have been. He must. He was a formidable opponent in, in some fashion, I guess. Or he wouldn't. He was like, was I guess. What is he like a Michael Myers, Jason, Freddy type? I guess. Yeah, he's like the least interesting of those guys. But I agree. I don't even know what the story is of those movies anywhere. I haven't of seen the them. Child's Play movies. Child's Play. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Colin Sparling wrote in, said, have you guys ever suffered the the lusophobia, a fear of the open sea? To think our world has a seemingly bottomless abyss terrifies me to no end. Keep kicking ass. Moriarty, boys. Are you afraid of the open ocean? Scary. I think that is a scary idea. Now, it's funny because that's really pretty much the opposite of claustrophobia, which I have pretty bad, actually. I'm really pretty claustrophobic, dude. But yeah, the ocean, because there's you can't. And, and again, it's almost like you said, it's like a fear of the dark thing. You can't see what's under there. You don't know how deep it is. And you know what's interesting about the ocean, even beyond like a fear thing? We really have we are just scraping the iceberg as far as understanding what's under there, because there is a lot. Of, I believe there's a lot of shit under the ocean that we haven't discovered yet. Like animals? As far as sea life. Yeah. You don't you're not saying that there's like you know, Atlantis or something. like that. No, I don't know if I believe in that. I believe them. I believe like ancient cultures like the Mayans and stuff had some pretty crazy shit. And there's a lot of cool stuff on Rogan actually about all the stuff about the rainforest how like we've just scra- we're just scraping the tip of the iceberg yeah there. because it was it's so overgrown that they're still discovering all these these complexes and whatnot. it's amazing it's awesome but no just as far as creatures you know are there things bigger than whales under there you know what's what's going on under there how can we possibly explore it to the degree we want to explore it and get the answers we want you it's, know it's true because the argument against space travel often is like well we have so much to discover under the ocean and i'm like yeah, that, I find oceanography and, and that, you know, that kind of discovery under the ocean very worthwhile and very interesting. But I think we can do both. And it's a little boring for me. Like when really? you get when you get when you get really down there. Yeah, it's some pretty it's interesting what, what can survive under that immense amount of pressure. About I mean, you're talking light. about you're talking about multiple atmospheres of pressure when you get down there. It, it would crush a fucking submarine, nonetheless, an animal. So. It's very interesting that some things can survive down there because no one ever really thinks about that. You're you're literally it's like why you have to come up slowly when you're scuba diving because you're under all this incredible I think it's barometric pressure yeah. that can destroy you. You're just not made for it. So it's interesting that there are species and and how evolution and natural selection works in such a way down there. Right. I've always been really fascinated by Marianas Trench and all of the really deep parts of the Pacific. That's where the deepest parts of the ocean are. Okay. Where it goes like 12, 13 14 miles down. That's insane. And there's definitely nothing living down there. I, I think that that would be impossible. That maybe maybe near volcanic volcanic vents or something like that. But they don't send stuff down. You can't send equipment down there. No, they just... do. I think like they have some of these really sophisticated submarines that can withstand the pressure. But there's no light. It's really fascinating. There's no light. So like you shine these things and that could be the first light that these animals have ever seen. A lot of these animals have no eyes. Right. Because they don't need them. They don't need vision. So. It is fascinating from that perspective, but I've never been quite scared of it. It is a little scary how big the ocean is, and I'm not talking about how deep, but just how big it is. It's, it's, it's very easy to get lost in the ocean. I can imagine how much courage it must have taken in the age of exploration, for instance, to just not have any clue where you're going. Imagine like Magellan circumnavigating the globe in what, the 15th century, and or the 16th century, and they had no fucking idea where they were going. Right. They were gone for years. Magellan didn't even survive it. That's amazing. Magellan himself died on that journey. So it's so amazing. If you look at the maps of like where they went and stuff like that, it's like they were just going. They had no idea where they were going. And it's just super cool. Like that they, is crazy. Down Tierra del Fuego and down the Cape of Good Hope and into the, you know, just going, just going, looking. Right. Discovering. Very interesting stuff. You know what's interesting, Colin? Have you had? I don't think I've ever had the experience of being out on an open body of water, be it the ocean or a great lake or anything like that, and not being able to see at least one shore. Yeah, I don't think I have either. I've never had that experience. I think that would actually terrify me. Now, if I was on a cruise ship and stuff like that, there's certain things that would probably pacify me a little bit because there's so many distractions. You know, you got those cruise ships that have water, they have like literal water parks and go kart tracks. These things are massive. But just looking around in each direction, like having a, a complete 360, 360 degree panoramic view of everything and not being able to see land, I think that would scare me. That is pretty scary. Cruise ships, by the way. No, I'm not doing it. No, nah, me neither. No, it's too, not it's too much. 
Those ships are too big. They're too weird. There's too many people packed together and that, that kind of stuff. It's these things go down. I don't even care if it went down. It's just like I, don't, I think you would be able to probably survive that because, you know, every, it's the modern, you know, modern. You can put out your SOS and get ships and rescue and all that. Kind right, of stuff. right, right. It's just too weird. I don't know. It's like this city, this floating city going from it's port pretty much to port. what it is. You're right. I don't know. I don't like it. Going port to port. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher Middling wrote into us and said, Hey guys, when I was three years old, I was in a horrible car accident. And even though I wasn't physically injured, the loud crashing sounds caused me to be deathly afraid of toilets. Oh. I was terrified of toilets until I was at least 12. I'd always cover my ears sprinting out of the room as if I could outrun the horrific sounds of the toilet water crashing in on itself. And don't even get me started on ice dispensers, which I still cover my ears on occasion. I am 20. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm sorry to hear about the car. Yeah, that's, that's, that's horrifying. Toilets, though. Yeah, that's, a, that's funny how that played out. Can't say I'm afraid of toilets. What if the accident was near water or something? Yeah, I would yeah. be. Yeah, especially because you were so young. It's it's some sort of primitive memory for you, probably. Mm. Toilets? No, I, I love toilets. Actually, I, I enjoy them. <laughs> what's better than a good poop? You know, what's better than that? I understand what you're saying. When you just feel so relieved and you just you just let it all go. It's great. <laughs> Caleb Hager wrote into us and said, "My greatest Thank childhood you. fear and current fear will always be bees, wasps, and hornets, uh. or any flying or singing insect." As a young child, I was stung by an entire hive and had to go to the ER. Oh my I've God. had a great phobia ever since and can't stand them. Any creatures that scared the ever-loving shit out of you guys as kids. I wonder what he got stung by. He yeah, I don't know. didn't say which one. Yeah, it, hopefully bees. I feel like wasps or hornets would have probably killed you. I feel like bees wouldn't do that. I don't know. Unless okay, you who, disturbed them. Yeah, I mean, maybe. I mean, I stuck, a couple of years ago, I stuck my hand. I, I think I told you this guy. I inadvertently stuck my finger in a wasp nest. That was in between. I have we have like rocks, you know, stacked like field stone around some of our planters on our, you know, in our yard. And I was like weeding, and I stuck my hand in between two layers of rocks, and I got one sting on like the tip of my finger, just above my fingernail. And you know what? When I moved the rock, there was like 80 wasps in there, and they could have done a lot more damage to me. And they didn't. They just they just did enough to tell say get the hell out of here. Right. Of and that hurt. Have you ever been stung by a wasp? Oh yeah, dude. It was like I was a landscaper. Pain for that's right. <laughs> for like 20 minutes. It was I've like been stung so many times. Oof. It, I always heard how bad it was, but it's pretty bad. It's it pretty hurt. bad. Yeah. It hurts. The last time I was stung, I was in college, and so it's it's been a while. But I ran over at what must have been a hornet or wasp nest with a ride on a lawnmower and got stung oh, a bunch no. of times. Yeah, it's painful. Oof. It's incredibly painful. You got multiple stung. bites. Oh, yeah. Oh. Oh, especially because hornets and, and yellow jackets and all those can sting many more times. Bees have a... They don't die. Yeah, bees have a preser like some sort of preservation where they don't want to sting unless it's completely necessary to protect them. But I think hornets, wasps, and yellow jackets are a little more aware. Have you ever looked at the hornets, the wasps, and the yellow jackets in Asia? You oh, be, God, you wanna, there's all different types. You want to be horrified? They're horrified. They're fucking huge. They're the size of, like, birds. Oh, so bad. That's awful. It's like unholy. I have seen those things. Com completely unholy. They kill huge spiders and right. they fight tarantulas and stuff like that. Yeah, it's, so it's nasty. They're really interesting creatures. And I actually like reading about them. I find them really interesting. I like hive minds a lot. They're... I, I, don't, I don't know that anyone really understands quite how they work. Because it's like a super intelligence, basically, in which it's like all these different component parts. And it's cool that they just like that thing just stung you without even thinking about it, probably because that was just its that its, was just, its role. Yeah, you know? that was its job. And then somehow signal to everyone else that it was probably fine. Right, right, right. It's it's very interesting. It's very interesting. They are pretty scary. And I get hard. I actually remember you spraying wasps outside of our house with Windex. You remember doing that? Because they would. You could. You could. We. So we had these shutters outside of our house on Long Island. These black shutters that always used to get wasp nests in them. Always. And so. We would like wait until dusk and I guess dad would do whatever he was going to do with them. But you could spray them these particular I think they were paper wasps or whatever. You could spray them with Windex or something and they would fall to the ground because they, it would fuck their wings up like they couldn't fly. Right, right, right. It would like lubricate their wings right. and then you could kind of like sw squash them or do whatever. you oh, do. Man. I remember doing that with you. I, I, I don't remember, but I've done it. I've done it more recently. You know, like in my old house, we had really bad wasp nests. They, they were just all over the place in the shutters and the shed. Not so bad here, actually. But the, you know what they say about wasps? That's funny. They say that they don't really serve any function. Like they're completely useless to like nature. They're completely to the useless. chain. But I then then I heard recently that they eat bad flies. And I know that they don't get along with spiders. But spiders are beneficial. So that's interesting. Yeah, 
They're very, they are fascinating. Why, I've always been fascinated by spiders and all these bugs that just look so menacing. Yeah, spiders look creepy. I, I wonder, because they're not necessarily going after sophisticated creatures, so I wonder, is like that fear, is that, is that like look relevant to their prey? You know what I mean? Where it's like, wow, those guys are scary looking. Yeah, I think, I would think so. Yeah, nature is really clever with that kind of stuff. Yeah, I say so. You know? Brandon Hardman wrote in, said, as a kid, I was walking, I was a walking mass of phobias. Thunderstorms, wasps, and witches were the three that I think <laughs> topped the list. Today, thunderstorms don't bother me and neither does the idea of witches, but a wasp buzzing my ear still makes me jump. Have you ever been scared of thunderstorms or witches, Dagan? Never been scared or witches? of thunderstorms. I, I actually thunderstorms. really enjoyed thunderstorms. Me too. You know my car got hit by a bolt of, th a bolt of lightning. That was when you were on the island, right? No, I was out here. I was oh, on okay. my way to the island. Oh, but I see. It happened in Jersey. Now, I don't know if, I, if, if a, car, a bolt of lightning hit my car or if my car hit a live wire that was hanging on the side of the road. One of the two things happened. And it, it was so funny how, you know, everything you hear about being in a car during a lightning storm, it, like you, I felt the car absorb the lightning because you have the, it's insulated for the rubber tires. But something weird happened with my radio. And that's why they say don't have your radio on. Now, I don't know if that applies to satellite radio like XM and Sirius and all that kind of stuff. But traditional radio, they say don't have it on during a lightning storm because that actually can conduct through and fry your the electronics on your car, whether it's the electronics or the computer or whatever. But I've never been afraid of it. I've never been afraid of it. I mean, I'd rather not be outside in a lightning storm. It's so funny how cavalier I was as a kid in Thunder and Lightning, which I guess a lot of us are. Like, I, never, I, I would go swimming. If oh, mom yeah. and dad didn't tell me to stop. Oh, definitely. Oh, I'd be all over the pool. This was another situation where I, it was very, that was another thing where I identified early that that's bullshit. That a, a, a bolt of lightning is not going to go into this pool. Right. Like, that's really. Has that ever happened? I'm sure it has. I'm sure it can. Right. But it's an, it's it's just what like, is odds? that really going to happen to me? <laughs> like, there's a thunderstorm covering all of Long Island in the tri-state area, and there's going to be a bolt of lightning that hits this pool. Really? Why? Yeah, that's a little. Strange. Doesn't make any sense. That's the kind of stuff. I I was I I'm proud that I was savvy enough as a kid to be able to f identify some of this bullshit. To be that is honest. pretty good, Carl. Now witches, I always thought you know I always construed them as very cartoony, Halloween, the Halloween decorations and everything. Then the 2016 movie The Witch came out. I never saw that. That's one. a scary movie. That's a very good movie. You would love that movie because it's a period piece as, as well. About the Salem witch trial? It takes place in those times, but I don't believe it's in Salem. It's about a family, a family of, I guess, they're Quakers, very, very religious, that they basically are either banished from their town or they construe everything as not religious enough. And they basically, they move out to, they move out to be on their own, like in the wilderness. And their encounter, the family's encounter with a with a witch. I don't think it's a coven of witches. I think it's a single witch. Dude, that movie is creepy. It's very, very well done. It's beautifully done. And the Blair Witch Project, I have to say, scared the shit out of me as well. I did. I did. I'm glad you brought that up because there's a Blair Witch game coming out actually soon, which is interesting. It's, oh, that's it's, interesting. It's coming only. To, I think it's only coming to Xbox and PC. But okay, they announced it at E3. But that movie also scared the living shit out of me. Oh, scary. I was going into tenth grade that summer. And what I always tell Dagan, and you, you, you tell people, Dagan, you'll know this, you'll remember this, is that the internet was primitive enough at this time mm. where there was this kind of undercurrent that this was real, that this was like, this really happened. And that this was, because it's it's a faux documentary. Right. And it really felt like a phenomenon that you could have only really understood if you were there at the time, that for a little while, everyone's like, did this really happen? Is this real or what? And I remember seeing it with Dana when I went and saw her in North Carolina one summer. I was staying with her for a couple of weeks, and it was a pretty terrifying thing. And specifically that Blair Witch symbol that they would hang up and you would find like these yes. little things. Yeah. I used to like have nightmares that I would see that. You did? Yeah, and like how horrifying that you were is. young. Yeah, that was a, that's an authentically scary movie for I a agree. lot of different reasons. I agree. I actually really like that movie a lot. I wonder if it holds up. We have to watch that sometime. Yeah, we should do an episode on it. That's actually a great idea. Yeah. Alex Ball wrote in and said, I had two big fears as a child. One was semi-rational and the other was ludicrous. The semi-rational one was Storm. So we talked about that. I watched Twister way too young and was uh, always afraid to die in a tornado. So even when it was just a thunderstorm, I would get scared. Were you ever afraid of, t of tornadoes? I saw a couple of pretty close funnel clouds on Long Island when I was playing Little League when I was a kid. Really? That were at... Burn Crits, the elementary school where all the baseball fields were, where like it was, it, 
I don't know that it would have even touched down and did much, but that where it was making its way. Yeah, I remember that very well. Wow, that's unbelievable. You know, we get a lot of tornado warnings here now, but this is a new phenomenon for this area. I would say within the last three years, I guess because of the high pressure system and the heat and the humidity happens a lot. But no, I've never been preoccupied with tornadoes, but I will say one of the most awesome things in nature, definitely one of the most awesome phenomena in nature as far as a, from a visual standpoint and from a destructive standpoint. And you know what, Kyle, about a year ago, did you see the footage? Richmond, Virginia, where our family lives, had a twister that touched down. Yeah. I, and somebody I, had it on YouTube. I believe, yeah, I think Uncle Mike or someone was telling and me about that. And it was that. swallowing up some buildings. I mean, it was a proper twister. It wasn't like you see down in the Midwest, but it was pretty It was pretty bad. I mean, it was ripping through buildings. It was going along and, like, destroying buildings. It was pretty, it was pretty awesome because, again, that's not really common on the East Coast of the United States, and that's starting to happen. So... You know, global like, warming. Again, again, yeah, the shift in weather. Well, because tornadoes, I think, are are constructed pretty much of the confluence of cold and or of cold and warm air, and, right. and the fronts that they cause. What's interesting about tornadoes, which I didn't know, I just looked it up when you were talking, just to be sure that I was remembering this correctly, is that tornadoes are not possible almost anywhere in the in the world except for the United States because of the specific topography that we have here That's and the way the way it rests so i was reading it's like an australia south africa and the united states are pretty much the only places where tornadoes That's happen. so interesting because of just the specific i guess nature of the jet streams and the way the storms come in and the topography we have because we have what's called tornado alley in the united states which is the Great Plains, and that's perfect. It perfect. needs flat land. Yeah, it needs right? flat land, and it, and the, I mean the storms in the middle of the United States, for those that don't know, are gnarly. I mean they are gnarly in the Panhandle of Texas, in Oklahoma, Nebraska. Some pretty badass shit going on. Those there. storm chasers are unbelievable, man. I you know yeah, I, I have to psychopaths. say though, and I don't mean to, to, this to sound morbid. If I could see one without it, like somewhere in the wilderness or somewhere where it's not going to destroy people's property or kill anybody, that's something I would like to see with my own eyes. Even if it was at a distance, I think you can hire people to bring you on storm chasers. Because it's pretty cool. I mean, that that's a it's. I mean, it's it's really horrifying, but it's also beautiful. You know, it's one of those things. It's like there's nothing else like that. Yeah, they're destructive. I mean, they are Oof. a unique destructive force, and uh, I've always been pretty fascinated by them as well. And especially the way that Air Man and Mega Man Two was able to conjure oh, up so many good tornadoes. Pull. Very good interesting. Pull. Very complicated technologies. That was very important to pull out Airman and not the Wizard of Oz there. Yeah. And I'm very proud of you. Thank you. I don't, I don't talk about the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> we, we'll do one on that, too. Joseph Addy wrote in and said, My greatest childhood fear were aliens by far. Oh, here we go. I remember having dreams at night that aliens were at the foot of my bed and that I was paralyzed and could not move. Because your imagination is uncontainable as a child, fear seems to have the greatest effect on us. I remember later reading about other people having dreams about little aliens paralyzing them at the foot of their bed. Only mine were regular size. I am pretty sure it was all inspired by E.T., Mac and Me, and the alien-centric 80s media I consumed. I still haven't seen Close Encounters of the Third Kind and never will. Definitely don't watch that if you're don't afraid of aliens. Don't watch that if you're scared. Were either, were either of you scared of aliens? Yeah. Dagan was the one responsible for scaring the shit out of me about aliens. I'm not even talking about Fire in the Sky. Oh, because that's one of the scariest films about aliens ever made. Which we talked about in our scariest movies episode that's early on in the knockback run so you guys can go listen to that that is a horrifying movie that we shared that Dagan took me to when I was in third grade so thanks for that absolutely frightening movie aliens generally I, rem I think I've told this story but I remember going to our Aunt Christine she lived in Port Jeff on the north end of Long Island and I remember, I remember driving there with you and dad and Allie I don't know for some reason I don't know what it was it was in the 90s and we were talking about Ray Bradbury and and kind of the, the stuff we liked with the novels and all, you know, and short stories. And you were just scaring the shit out of me with some of these stories. And specifically, this I don't remember what the Ray Bradbury story is. It's a great one about the aliens that go in, that basically ha only the children can see the aliens. Yes. And they basically and, and they basically start stealing stuff from their parents and their parents just think they're playing and stuff like that. But they're basically planning on killing the adults, I guess. That yeah, kind it's of a conspiracy stuff. between the aliens and the kids. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's uh, always been a little scary and a little unsettling. I think what's unsettling about aliens generally is that for us to encounter an extraterrestrial being means that they are just so far advanced that there's really nothing we can do about it. That's what's always been pretty scary about it. That's very scary. And just not knowing, yeah, what what they would be. Are, are they going to be peaceful? Are they going to be warlike? Are they going to be, you know, are we going to be like a, a molecule of sand compared to what they're capable of? Whatever it is. Now, I never told anybody this, Kyle, except for maybe one well, definitely one person, Helene, knows about this. But I've had two experiences with, two unexplained experiences with aliens. Phenomena. Phenomena. Probably 20 years apart, and the exact same thing happened. 
And the exact same thing was like, it's completely unexplainable. So when I was living, I don't think I ever told you this. When I was living in Brookhaven, it was before mom and dad got separated. So it was probably the late 80s. It could have been 88, could have been 89. We weren't in the house that long. We were only in the house for a couple of years at that point. My bedroom was in the front corner of the house. So my window faced the front of the cul-de-sac and the side, the street that our house was bordering, which was... Well, old Stump old Road. Old Stump Road. So, one night, unexplained, no noise. There was no noise. There was no nothing. It was just a blue light, an intense blue light shining in my window from above. I think you did tell me this a long time ago. Yeah. Very and creepy. Re- there was no way it could have been a car headlight. There was just no way because of the angles of everything, the angle of the road, the angle of the cul-de-sac, and the, the angle that the light was coming in, that it had to be from above. There was no noise associated with it. It was a blue light. It probably lasted for like 10 seconds and then it was gone. And uh, it always like scared the hell out of me. It always freaked me out. Then when Helene and I were in our first house, this was probably, we bought that house in 2004 and we sold it in 2009. So it could have been any time in there. Let's say, it was, and it, I think it was before we had our first kid. So it was probably, which was 2007. So it was probably in 2005 or 2006. Helene and I fell asleep on the couch. It was super late at night. Uh, watching a movie and it was really late it was like two or three in the morning and the couch was along like the front bay window like it was a smaller house it had like a front bay window and that was sort of like took up the sort of like our our couches now we have a bay window behind the couch and it was sort of like the almost the entire length of the couch but the curtains were drawn and a really intense blue light i woke up because there was a really intense blue light coming in the window. Now, this light couldn't have been coming from anywhere because there were no roads. You know what I mean? There was just a road that was in front of our house and a car would actually have to be sideways facing my house. And I looked out and there was no cars. It was just quiet. Everybody was asleep. There was no lights on outside. I don't remember if our street even had a street light. It was a very dark neighborhood. And again, that the trajectory of the light was coming from above. But it was the exact same light and for the exact same time as the first time it happened. And nothing happened in between those two times. It was the weird, it's the weirdest thing. Do you think it's you? Do you think, is it possible that you were dreaming? That I, yeah, you know what? No, because Helene saw it the second time. Oh, okay, that's right. Okay. She witnessed it the second time. Now, that was always my big thing in the back of my head. Was, was that a dream? Was that just, I just thought I was seeing something? I was hallucinate a hallucination of some kind? But yeah, it's so strange, isn't it? It's the weirdest thing. And usually I'm really good at being able to be logical and just explain things away, but there's really no explanation for those two things. You just have to accept it as one of those weird things that you can't explain. So yeah, the the alien thing really intrigues me. You know, we were talking about that the other day. Like it's pretty preposterous to think sometimes, I think that, you know, there's no other life out there. I think that's really hard to wrap your head around. I think there's got to be something. And I'm not saying I experienced something. I don't know what the, that was, but pretty food for thought anyway. Yeah, I would say so. I, I, It's like the old saying goes, I really do want to believe. And I do believe. Like we were talking the other night when we were at the diner. We were at the diner at like three in the morning and we were talking about Bob Lazar, who, again, is really interesting dude. You guys can go look up. He was recently on Rogan. Yeah. Talking about his experiences at air or his purported experiences at Area S4, where he was working on alien craft for the American government. And he talks, uh, you know, interestingly about what what his experiences were. But I think that there's a weird commonality between people in the U.S., specifically in Canada, I think, as well, where people just see a lot of shit here. And it kind of all ties. in. I'm not saying you don't see things in Western Europe or anywhere else, but. There's just a lot of it here. Now, America is a quirky place and we kind, strange. we kind of facilitate that kind of culture by being very laissez faire. So well, that's not even the remotely the weirdest thing that goes on in the Amer- American culture is our like acceptance of UFOs and ufology and all that kind of stuff, generally speaking. But it could all tie into the Bob Lazar thing about how they found those ships in Nevada and they're testing them here. They're doing this, that or the other thing or they're kind of active here, not because we're the US, but because they're just they just happen to be active around this area. But you would imagine if they had this technology to get here and to communicate with us and stuff like that, that they could do whatever they wanted. And I guess the only skeptical thing about these stories would be like, why would it be you? Why would it be me? You know, why would it be this person? Why would they care? Right. Why right. Would they it's so you? strange. It's so random. It's not a space issue. Like I said the other night, it's a time issue. That's the thing that stops us from seeing aliens. It's time. It's not space. Space is vast, but it's the time 
and the age of the universe combined with the space that makes it so improbable. When you think about the fact that like if anyone was just listening for us with radio waves and stuff, they would only know for about 80 years that we were even here. So if they were further than 80 light years away, they still don't know. And that's almost everything. That's unbelievable. That's that's I think there are only probably like a dozen stars within 80 light years of us. Wow. So that's unbelievable. It's very interesting to think about it from that perspective where it's just a time issue. Right. That's what's so compelling about Bob Bob Lazar's story to me. He's an interesting dude. I think the whole thing might be punishment for taking you to go see fire in the sky too young. Possibly so. I think I'm being punished for that. Ain't nothing scarier than that. I'll take it. Ain't nothing scarier than that. (laughs) Tiernan McDonald has a quick one. He says, I was afraid of being beat to death. I still am. Oh my God. Okay, goodbye. That's all he had to say. Getting beat to death. Are you an egg? (laughs) Could be. James Kinzel the third wrote in and said, I discovered porn at a young age. I was about 12 or 13 when I found a nude picture of Angelina Jolie. And shortly after that, I discovered internet porn. My biggest fear was getting <laughs> caught while watching porn. And while I never actually got caught watching it, it wasn't until much later that I discovered that deleting the history was a thing. My mom discovered porn on her computer once in that and was livid. I also once bought p- pay-per-view porn. And again, my mom was livid. My dad, though, his only question was, why didn't you DVR it? <laughs> that was sad. That's fantastic. That's an interesting fear. Oh, that's funny. Well, you know what? I think everybody probably went through that at one time or another, right? Sure. In their, in their youth. In the youth? Well, you just would go in the woods and look at magazines. That's true. We were old school. David Graham wrote in and said, As a small child, I distinctly recall having a long bout of nightmares relating to Darth Vader with his helmet off at the end of Return of the Jedi. Oh. I, I would describe said dreams to my mother as being attacked by the white man. So my question is, did you ever have lasting effects from a piece of media like this, even ones that weren't meant to frighten? Humpty Dumpty Vader, as I like to call him. That's ironic that you were afraid of good Darth Vader, the only good Vader I know. we ever got. That's, That's little, true. That's a good point. Very interesting. That's a good point. Did any media really stick with you for a long period oh, of time? God, yeah. I mean, I talk about it a lot. Watership Down. You know, again, oh, right, the watching intro- those things too early. Poltergeist scared the shit out of me. Somebody wrote an essay about Poltergeist and watching it too young and how it scared the hell out of them and how it scarred them. And I want to read that. I don't know if it's comedic or what, but it's very similar. Poltergeist, I was obsessed with. The Thing, John Carpenter's The oh, Thing. Oh, that's such a good movie. Love it. Awesome. It scared, it terrified the hell out of me, but I had to watch it every time it was on. You know, those type of things. Those were scarring. Aliens, to a certain degree, had that effect on Definitely. me. Aliens had that. To- that movie's I- horrifying. You know what What scene really scares me in that film? Newt's brother. Mm. When he's saying the whole kill me thing. Right. That was, like, really heavy for me. Like, that that scene stuck with me for a long time. That scene was pretty emotionally scarring, I think, for me, actually. And then, of course, uh, Johnny, got, for that. Johnny got his gun. Oh, my God. Of Johnny course. got his gun was just... Yeah, thank Metallica for that, because I probably would have never known about it had it not been for Metallica, the one music video, the one video. Yeah. Yeah. That was a big one for me. The Johnny got his gun thing was the most disturbing. That was the most disturbing for me, thinking that, you know, again, uh, what that's a Dalton Trumbull story, right? But I think it's based on a true story. And that's what was so horrifying about it for me. You know, and again, it plays into the whole war thing. And we'll get into that, too. But yeah, th- those are just the tips of the iceberg. I mean, a lot of things. I think I was so sensitive as a kid. A lot of things scarred me. What about you, Kyle? What, what things uh, stuck with you? Nosferatu, the 20s or 30s movie, scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. And I used to rent it from the library and then like never be able to really watch it because it was so horrifying. Do the you know, original. Yeah. Do you oh, know what I'm talking I know about? very well. It's yeah, I've seen probably it. some of the scariest shit I've ever seen it's in my beautiful life. beautiful cinematography. Yeah. Really but horrifying creature. It is scary. It holds up. They re- uh, Cinemassacre did a piece on that. You know, James Rolfe being a huge horror buff of uh, the influence of that movie and how it holds up so well. You know what? The single I, I'll talk to you guys about my single my earliest fear, the earliest fear I could remember as a kid. And I was terrified of this. And it's ironic, especially where I work now. There was a thing on Sesame Street. It, I was really young. So we're talking about 1974. I was born very late in 73. So this is probably from 74. I was a baby. And one of my very first memories, let alone one of my very first fears, you guys have got to go. It's on YouTube. I checked today. Go watch it. It's a little segment, a little two-minute segment called Sammy the Snake. And Sammy the Snake was this puppet. And he was he was on a pitch black background. And they must have just laid him down because he's S-shaped. And he sings about the letter Sammy the Snake. And he sings a song about the letter S. And he must be controlled by sticks. Maybe a couple of different people are controlling him. 
And he was the scariest thing I had ever seen. Like, he terrified me as a kid. He haunted my dreams and nightmares for years. And when you look at it, you realize, yeah, this is kind of creepy. It's actually, right now, if you look at it now, it's kind of charming. He's singing the song about the letter S, and he's acting like kind of like beat Nicky. He's like, yeah, far out, you know, blah, blah, blah. But he just looks scary. And you could see it. He's got, like, these dead eyes. He's got, like, these half lids. And, dude, he terrified me. And he was one of the, when the, you know, the, we had the advent of the internet and being able to find anything online, even pre-YouTube. He was one of the first things I searched out because I wanted to see what it looked like again. It's friggin' terrifying. Go watch Sammy the Snake. The song is actually quite catchy. Oh, well. But he scared the living shit out of me as a kid. Well, that's a positive aspect of it anyway, And it comes full circle because now I work at Sesame Workshop. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary now. You gonna bring and him back? Well, everybody had to be on video. Well, the, you had to volunteer. You could tell a story about what Sesame means to you. And I told the story about how Ses Sammy the Snake terrified me as a kid. So I don't think I'll be making the real. But that was my, <laughs> I was like, that's my, that's my earliest memory is like Sammy the Snake was terrifying. Like that's, that's what I remember about Sesame Street. That was my very earliest memory about Sesame Street. That's funny, man. Yeah, I, I feel like other other media. I mean, there was things that scared me, but Large Marge obviously was, oh, that was, was a biggie. from uh, Pee Wee. You were little. Yeah, that used to really frighten me. That scene a lot as a kid. That was like pretty horrifying stuff to me. But generally speaking, I think I just kind of got over. I was more in my head with things that like hypothetical things as opposed to to the actual palpable fear of a, a visual of media with a, with a few rare exceptions. All right, next up, please. Straw Hat Ninja wrote in and said, I was a pretty wimpy kid growing up, but when I was little, I was terrified of going to the doctor because I didn't want to get a shot. Did you guys fear the doctor's office as youngsters? Never. We no. had the coolest pediatrician on our planet Earth. Doctor, The doctor never scared me. No. Now, I will say that I had some scary things happen to me at the doctor. Yeah. <laughs> because of my, stu that. my stomach issues and oh, all that kind of right. stuff. I've had many a finger in my ass, but not okay. for sexual pleasure. Okay. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with that. And... <laughs> Also, I got like an STD test in college and they shoved like a Q-tip like thing in my pee.